If you're listening on the podcast, this is the Spiritual Awakening Show. I'm your host, Brent Spirits, and this is another Kundalini After Dark session. We're live on Zoom. We've got about 20 people in the Zoom call here. We've got a few people on YouTube. It's going to be an exciting time, I think. Today's topic is Kundalini Shakti and creativity. So today I want to begin with a translation of the Adi Shakti mantra, originally a Sanskrit mantra, but I won't attempt to pronounce it accurately in Sanskrit. So I will attempt to read it in English. This is the Adi Shakti mantra. I bow to the primal power. I bow to the all-encompassing power and energy. I bow to that through which God creates. I bow to the creative power of the Kundalini, the Divine Mother power. So once again, that's the Adi Shakti mantra, originally a Sanskrit mantra. It sounds really beautiful in Sanskrit. There's a lot of great tracks, kirtan music online with that mantra. Of course, this is a mantra to the Shakti, which is the power of consciousness. Right? It's the creative force. It is the power through which God creates. It is the force of all creation, the Shakti, the force of all creation. So the Shakti that flows through you is the ultimate source of all creative inspiration. So this is what we're going to speak about today. So how can we with Awakened Kundalini, how can we that are in touch with the Shakti, with the first force of all creation, right? the creative power of God, how can we channel it forth in our own creative endeavors? We'll talk about that today. I'll share some of my ideas and I want to hear from everybody else as well. Okay. So, of course, Shakti can be channeled into art, but please don't see creativity as only artistic expression in the you know stereotypical ways that we know about, which are of course you know painting, singing, music, photography. Okay, it's all all of these forms. In fact, creativity is the reason that the entire universe itself has come into being. Right, the entire universe you could say is one big creation. It's one big artistic expression. Everything, all of it. You know, even a, you know, a blank wall, blank canvas, a rock, all of this is all art, it's all creation from the Shakti, okay? So you want to expand our idea of what creativity is here, move it beyond just the typical artistic realms into everything, right? Everything, okay? So we can channel our creativity forth into, of course, the creative arts, like we know. We can also channel forth into relationships, you know, coming up with creative ways to uh, make our relationships fresh, exciting, to resolve challenges, right? We can show up in new ways in relationships. We can channel forth creativity into problem solving. You know, putting two seemingly disconnected ideas together together to come up with a very creative solution, right? To innovate. We can be creative in sports. We can be creative in the way that we play, okay? Something that we all have access to in our own way, and it is inspired by the Shakti, by the goddess, okay? So... As I came up with my notes today, I was starting to think, you know, some people ask, you know, what's the goal of Kundalini Awakening? What's the point? And we can say it in many different ways. We can say the point is self-realization, is union with the divine, union with God, our next step in our evolution. But another idea came to me, which I haven't heard anybody else share. And I thought, you know, maybe Kundalini is to make us creative, right? to make us creative. Of course, getting in touch with God in a state of union, in a state of yoga, with the ultimate creator, God, Shakti. So, of course, you know, it's not that far-fetched to think that maybe the goal is to make us creative, to inspire us, right? Speaking specifically to the Kundalini process and the many ways that many of us are going through, you know, we maybe have spontaneous Kriyas coming up, of course, spontaneous movements happening, spontaneous mudras with the hands, maybe spontaneous mantras, vocalizations are coming forth. All of these are coming from the original source of creation, which is the Shakti. And so you can say that these Kriyas, these movements, these mantras, these mudras, these gestures, they came forth through the Shakti. No individual thought them up with their own mind, with their own ego, right? It was a creative 
expression. So all spiritual development, in fact, all original forms of yoga, you can say they're a form of art, they're a form of creativity inspired by the goddess herself. So when you're moving and kriyas are happening to you, you're in touch with the original source of yoga, right? This is how all of the, the great yogic texts and all of this stuff came about is because people documented what those going through kundalini awakening were experiencing. And they said, oh, this person's having a spontaneous movement. They're putting their fingers together in a certain way. Let's document these things. And then they came up with these systems of yoga. So in the same way, if you happen to be having spontaneous phenomena happening to you, it's essentially a creative expression coming through you directly from the source, directly from the source. Okay. So I've been diving really deep into this theme lately of, of creativity. And uh, I've been using the support of some really incredible authors, some really incredible artists. And maybe you're familiar with these two guys, Stephen Pressfield and Rick Rubin. So they're at the top of my list right now. Stephen Pressfield is a best-selling author. He wrote my favorite book ever. It's called The War of Art. Not to be confused with Sun Tzu's The Art of War. This is Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. Rick Rubin is one of the greatest mu music producers ever. I know, of course, some may uh, have some criticisms about his style, but you know he's a pretty celebrated music producer. He's worked with incredible artists from uh, all sorts of genres, Jay-Z, ACDC, Metallica, Chili Peppers, all sorts of great artists. Now, both these individuals are very spiritual. It, it, it's, it's, their, their work is just oozing with spirituality. Uh, Rick Rubin began meditation when he was 14. Stephen Pressfield writes, in his work directly, it's a strong theme running through his work about being inspired by the goddess to be a creative, to, to bring forth a creative act. So, of course, the goddess Shakti Kundalini. Now, I don't know whether they're dealing with Kundalini directly, but of course, they're dealing with this source of all creation, right? And that's what they're sharing about in their work. I see your KK saying, I love the creative act by Rick Rubin. Yes, I'm making my way through that. I actually haven't even finished the book and I'm so fired up. I'm, I'm you know, singing... Uh, the praises for that book already. It's so, so good. Um, and so that's what their books are about. I, I recently, just yesterday, I found a podcast conversation between the two of them. And I thought this is, this is the real treat. So in this conversation, Pressfield tells Ruben, he says, define divinity. Because Ruben was speaking about divinity. And Ruben says, it's everywhere. And Pressfield says, is it a human phenomenon? Would it exist a million miles in space? And Ruben says, I think it would exist anywhere. It's the energy that drives all things, all nature, all life, all growth, everything, right? So going back to the Adi Shakti mantra, right? I bow to the creative power of the Kundalini, the Divine Mother, the power through which God creates, right? Right? So they're talking about the same thing here. So they're very tapped in. They're speaking about, of course, uh, this universal practice of invoking the goddess, invoking the source energy, whatever you would like to call it. Of course, they use their own language, which is good. It's good that they use their own language. Why? Because it shows it's a universal experience. It's a universal phenomenon. It's a universal process that we're going through. Spiritual development, creative expression. It's not just this Indian yogi thing. It's not just this Sanskrit thing, Okay. So, so how do we tap into this creative power of Shakti, right? To bring forth art, to bring forth creativity in all of the many different ways that we can. Well, throughout this series, it's, it's a theme that runs through my work, but in particular, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how to survive Kundalini purges. And the theme that I was sharing was you, have much cre you must create a container, a regular container that you go into to practice going through these purges. So you create space. It's say an hour every day before bed where you sit and you allow things to come up. You allow emotions to come up. You allow thoughts to come up. You allow yourself to cry, to move, to shake, to go into meditation. You create these containers and you go there regularly to purge, to release the difficult emotions. So we create this structure, this masculine structure of time and space. It's rigid, it's solid, right? And then the feminine can become expressed in those containers. The emotions come up. We, we cry, we chant, we, we move, we have kriyas, whatever it is that comes up. Okay, so we have these kriyas. So we show up every day into the container. 
This is the practice, right? Well, eventually, after some time, the purging, hopefully, hopefully, will end, and and I'm 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 sure it will come to a relative sense of completion for for all of us. At some point, the purging stops. The difficult emotions end. the The dark night of the soul is over. We feel peace. We feel bliss. Now, do we stop going to the container? Do we stop showing up on a regular basis? No, no, no. We continue to show up to our spiritual practice, even if we've come overcome the purges. Now, why do we continue to show up? It's because in that container, now that all of us, our junk has been purged, now we have an empty space. Now we're an open channel. Now in that container, we can be inspired. So rather than a difficult memory from your childhood coming up, now a brilliant idea comes up. Now a brilliant thought, a brilliant solution to what you've got going on. Inspiration comes forth from the muse, from Shakti, from the goddess, right? From the creative force, right? So we go into this state of receptiveness, openness, non-attachment, and we just, just chill, just wait. And the goddess will inspire. So as, you know, old karma stops arising, the, the buried emotions stop arising. Now your mission comes forth, your purpose, your calling, your work. You get messages, go and do this, write this book, send this message to a friend, take this note down. You know, these insights start coming because we're open, we're receptive. So this is the muse. The muse gives us these genius ideas and these impulses. Now, I want to pull up a, a page here. This is uh, Stephen Pressfield's uh, book, Turning Pro. Fantastic book. He says, turn pro, which means show up regularly like a professional to your creative endeavors, to your spiritual practice, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you have a nine to five job, you show up there, you know, every day by nine o'clock, you're there, you work, you check, you clock out, you go home. But when people are creative, when they're artists, when they're, you know, trying to uh, channel forth, you know, their creativity, it's, they feel like it must be sporadic. They got to only show up when they feel inspired. But he says, no, turn pro and show up regularly, show up to the container every day on a regular basis. And that's when, of course, the muse shows up. So I opened this book up just to a random page, just about 10 minutes before beginning. And this is the, the passage that I came to. A practice has a time. The monks in their saffron robes mount the steps to the zendo at the same hour each morning. When the abbot strikes the chime, the monks place their palms together and sit. You and I may have to operate in a more chaotic universe, but the object remains the same. To approach the mystery via order, commitment, and passionate intention. When we convene day upon day in the same space at the same time, a powerful energy builds up around us. This is the energy of our intention, of our dedication, of our commitment. The goddess sees this energy and she rewards it. So that's just one random page that I opened up to from Stephen Pressfield's book, Turning Pro. Of course, he has uh, a few books in this series. The first is The War of Art, A-plus books, absolutely incredible work. Now, the goddess, the muse, of course, in Greek mythology, the muse is the goddess of the arts and inspiration. She's what the most popular thing of all time is named after, of course, music, right? It's coming from the same source here, the feminine, the goddess. Now, the muse, however, she doesn't just inspire anybody. She doesn't just show up to anybody, okay? She must be invoked. And how we invoke her is through a state of surrender, through a state of openness, and of course, how do we get into those states? Well, we show up for the work. Like how the monks show up every day to sit, we must show up to our own container and become receptive to the inspiration. So they say that the muse wants to catch you only when you're working. Only when you show up to do the work, then she comes. Many of us want to wait. Okay, I'll wait till I get inspired, then I'll sit to work. No, we have to sit to work and then we get inspired. This is how it works, right? So we show up, you sit in the state of receptiveness. Craig Holiday said that his teacher once told him that when we wake up, we become a slave to God. We become a slave to God. Now, I know that might be scary. You know, Remember, this is the goddess. She's compassionate. She's loving. She's caring. She's empathetic. Right? It's not a scary, punishing God that you're a slave to. You're a slave to you know, the, the creative goddess. Very loving. Very, very loving. Very inspiring. Right? So as we become empty through this process, 
We give it all up to her and say, use me. I'm here. Use my hands. Use my skills. Use my voice. Use me. I'm your slave. And when she uses you to bring forth creative art, it's absolutely incredible. There's not torturous. It's not laborious. It doesn't feel like a chore, right? You, you, sometimes you feel like you can stay up for days on end being creative and writing. You know, right now I'm sharing what I was inspired to put together because I said, use me like your slave. And these are the notes that came to me. And I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm actually, there's nowhere else I would rather be than right here speaking to you all, channeling forth what's coming through me. So this is, this is how it is. We become a slave to God. And that's, that's what Craig Holiday's teacher told him. Craig Holiday is fantastic. Really, really fantastic. I've got an interview with him on my channel. He does a lot of work with Kundalini. Really good, good stuff. So like I'm saying here, inspiration, creativity, and the music, they need to be invoked. They need to be summoned, right? So we summon them by entering the container to show her, hey, we're ready, right? But we don't cling and say, I'm ready. Give me something creative. We say, I'm ready. I'm open. I'm receptive, but it's up to you. If you want to inspire me, I'm here. If you don't want to inspire me, no problem. We'll go at your own pace. No attachment to what comes, just showing up to the container, right? And that's the same way that we approach the purging, the purification. We just show up. Sometimes nothing happens. That's okay too, right? Sometimes intense things happen. That's okay. We approach it all impartially. Whatever comes, it's all welcome. We just do our job by showing up, right? So this is why I say, you know, like I've said, we have to carve up time each day for our sadhana, for our spiritual practice, right? Eventually that process will come to an end and then we can use that same practice, that same discipline that we've cultivated, that same space that we've created to allow the goddess to begin to move us. Now, of course, it's a little easier said than done, right? The ego will come in with all sorts of forms of resistance to the creative flow, to the process. They'll come up with excuses. I'm not ready. I'm not good enough to be you know, creative. There's no solution to this problem. You know, I'm nobody. Who am I? I shouldn't waste my time. It's scary. It's so on. These are all excuses that come up from the ego. And some of them can seem like, you know, they're humble. You know, who am I to be a creative? It sounds like, you know, maybe it's humility, right? No, it's not humility. It's insecurity, right? And if anything, you could even look at it, you know, to say who, that you're not worthy of being a creator in some respects, it could mean, you know, it could be like, you know, you're a bit arrogant because it's almost like you think that you're special because you think you're so special that you're not worthy of being a creative. Well, this is a creative universe. We're all creative. So who are you to think you're not creative, right? You can look at it that way. Maybe it's a little arrogant to think that you're not creative, right? Something to think about there. Pressfield, he calls this force resistance with a capital R. So he, he's personified it as resistance, right? And resistance shows up. You know, you have this idea you want to you sit to meditate, but there's resistance. It's almost like, you know, on your meditation cushion, there's this force field stopping you from, from meditating. So you know, you think, oh, I've got to do other stuff. I'm not ready or it's, you know, I'm busy. There's all this force field pushing you away. You know, you want to put together something on online, some sort of project or something. There's a force field around your keyboard stopping you from doing it, which says, I'm not good enough. I'm not ready. Nobody's going to listen to me. Nobody, I have nothing interesting to say. Stops you, right? So Pressfield's work gets right to the chase. It's very, very direct work that he, he, he puts out. We acknowledge resistance and we sit down, we show up anyway. And once we sit down and show up to meditate or to write at the keyboard or to, to film a video, whatever it is, then the muse says, ah, okay, you showed up. All right, inspiration comes. And it is universal. Like it's universal. Anybody who practices it in this way experiences some, some incredible things begin to happen, okay? So that's how we overcome resistance. And every day we have to overcome resistance. It's not once, it's every day. Sometimes multiple times a day, we have to overcome this force field of resistance. But when we do, the muse shows up, right? So she likes people that are courageous. She likes people that are serious about the work, right? So by overcoming resistance, we invoke the muse. So uh, a few weeks ago, I spoke about the witch wound. And when I was speaking about the witch wound, I described Katrina Michelle's concept of spiritual resistance. So it's the same force, right? Except spiritual resistance is operating the spiritual domain. Spiritual resistance says, I'm scared to meditate or, or I'm not, uh, I'm going crazy or, or you know, I, I can't follow through with this process. It's too scary. Or what will my friends and family think? What will my culture think? Right. So that's spiritual resistance that stops us from doing our spiritual work. But of course, resistance shows up after we've done the spiritual work. Now we're open. Now we're a channel where we're, we're ready for creative energy, creative juice to flow through us. 
but then resistance still shows up and stops us from doing that. So that's why maybe you've gone through your purging period. You've gone through your, your dark night of the soul and you're still not yet able to, you know, really tap into your, your creative power. It's because resistance is still at play and resistance. I don't think it ever goes away every day. We have to recognize it and show up. And so be very wary of resistance. Don't take it for granted. It's, it shows up. It's beyond resistance that really the creative juices start to flow. So I really recommend um, Pressfield's work. It, it is just fantastic, fantastic work. Um, it's after reading The War of Art for the second time that I actually began this work as Brent Spirit. I said, I, I, I have to start. And so that's when I started to make my talks on Kundalini. That's how the muse came to me. She said, talk about Kundalini, talk about me. That's what she, the, the muse, Shaki, told me. She said, talk about me. So I began speaking about her. And I really didn't want to do it. I really didn't want to show my face. I really didn't want to be on video. Um, I didn't want to set up cameras and do any of that stuff. But I knew that that was all resistance. So once I pushed through, I began. So if you go to my earlier videos, I've got all sorts of like acne scars and pimples. I don't want to be on camera. I really don't. But I recognize all that is just BS coming from resistance trying to stop me from doing my work. And so when I pushed through that, I made myself vulnerable. I showed up. It started to flow. Now, if you look at the uh, posting dates of my of my videos, my podcast, whatever it is, it's inconsistent. And you can see every time that it's inconsistent, you can look back and know that resistance had me. Resistance was beating my ass. Every, every period where there wasn't a video released, it's because resistance had me. And every time I put something out, it's, I beat resistance. And every time I beat resistance, the, the energy flows, the community forms, people start to share the work. It, it just, this is, this is how it happens. And of course, I'm like, you could say maybe a, a caricature of tapping into the creative flow of Shakti because I'm speaking about her, speaking about Shakti, speaking about Kundalini, and that's my creative expression. But it happens in all domains, music, art. Um, I, I channeled this type of way in when I was a photographer, which had nothing to do with Kundalini directly. Right. So I've lived it in many different ways. And I know many of us are have here as well. And I'm curious to hear about all of your experiences with uh, creativity, which we'll get to in a little bit. So Stephen Pressfield's work, it's, it's fantastic. Anything you ever see me put out at any point in my life, know that it is because of Stephen Pressfield's work, The War of Art. Know this. That's how powerful his book is. I, I recommend it to everybody. I don't even have a copy of it. I only have a copy of Turning Pro because I, I just give The War of Art away. If I have a copy of it, I just find somebody who needs it. I just give it to them. Um, but with that said, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect at showing up. Even now, I'm, I'm still resistance, you know, gets me down. But, you know, let me tell you, once I committed to this community and showing up once a week for the After Dark sessions, and then once a week every Monday for the Kundalini Q&A meetings, it's free. I, I, I ask for donations. I appreciate it, but it, it's free. I show up because I love it. And because I know that this is what I'm called to do. And uh, I, I'm not attached to any outcome. I just show up. And ever since I've done that, the relationship I have with the muse has become very, very close. Because now there's consistency. I show up regularly to do the work. And so this is, this is what I mean. You know, you show up to the container. This is a container that I've created. There's structure. And, you know, we, have a, we meet at 10 p.m. Eastern every Sunday. But within it, anything can happen. That's where the feminine can dance within this masculine container. And it's a really, really incredible way. So consider your own containers. Don't wait for inspiration to come. Set a container, show up, and then inspiration shows up. So I sat down, I wrote these notes just one hour before meeting here. I just, I make a deal with the, the, with Shakti. I say, okay, you know, you want me to speak about something? Let it start flowing and it just starts coming. I think it's pretty good. Maybe you disagree, but you know, it just starts coming. You know, like I said, it's not a chore. It's not a chore at all. Like this is just so incredible. Like, the energy that flows through me when I'm doing this work is just really incredible. I know many of us have felt it in our own way, right? And of course, you know, we can't take any credit for any of our creative endeavors. We really can't. It's, it's all the goddess. It's all the muse. We're just messenger, just channels, right? Um, even this own work, my own work here, I'm listening more than I'm speaking here. Consider that. I'm, I'm listening as I'm speaking. And part of me is taking notes. And part of me is going to go back and, and re-listen to the recording of this and, and let it sink in. Because this is, like like I said, this is only an hour old, what I put together here. It's all fresh, right? Because it's all coming from the muse. It's not coming from me. It's not coming from Brent, right? It's not coming from my mind. In the same way, like I said in the beginning, 
the spontaneous movements that have maybe happened, the mudras, the kriyas, spontaneous vocalizations. It's not coming from your mind. It's coming from somewhere else. You're just a witness to it. Same thing that's happening here. So Rick Rubin's book, he's got this book here. It's called The Creative Act. Beautiful looking book here. Just like really, really clean and slick. Um, he's got a quote here. It's not unusual for science to catch up to art eventually, nor is it unusual for art to catch up to the spiritual. So just a quick little thing that came to me to share. Here's another one I just opened up to randomly. The work reveals itself as you go, right? The goddess reveals herself as you go. You can't get the full picture right away. Sometimes we want the full picture, right? If I started this work and if I said, okay, goddess, I want to know everything that's going to unfold before I begin, it never would have happened. I just put out a few videos and then it starts growing from there. And I have no idea where, which direction it could go. And I still don't, it's going to keep growing. Who knows? Right. And so that's Rick Rubin's book, the creative act. It's really, really fantastic. Um, and he writes actually about a way of being the creative act is a way of being, it's not even a process or, or a specific event, right? It's about how to live moment to moment in touch with the flow, in touch with source, in touch with the expression of Shakti, though he doesn't use that term all around. So he says, if you really want to become creative to bring forth your expression as an artist in your own way, notice the art all around in the mundane things. You know, it's a way of being nonstop, 24 seven. There's art all around. We're just consuming it and we're soaking it in mindfully. And so we can enjoy the art and then we can feel in, feel into where the art that we're taking in, whether it's a movie, a film, a conversation, whether we're in nature, feel into the source of where that art is coming from. Feel into the, the, the underlying essence from where the words, the music, the painting, where did it come from? Feel into that energetically. That's the same source that you have within you. That's your Shakti within you. And if you can go there, right, then you can begin to express your own creativity from the same place that all of these great artists have expressed from. So it's kind of like every artistic expression is a finger pointing back at Shakti saying, hey, look, look at the source. Go there. And if we can go there, you can use the art as a doorway into the Shakti and then from into the Shakti, we can bring forth art out of the doorway, right? We can, we can bring gifts to the world. And it's, it's fantastic. It's really fantastic. Um, so earlier today, just before uh, um, meeting with you all, I sat down to listen to some music with this in mind, just taking it in. And I had a completely psychedelic experience just went right to the source. I was having, you know, hallucinations while listening to the music. Um, and I could see, like I said, where this music is coming from. It's coming from the muse, music. And I tapped in that place within myself. And it's from that place that I'm doing my best to speak to you from now. So I was listening to um, Dream Theater, really fantastic band. Uh, Dream Theater is like a prog metal band, progressive metal band. Uh, every single member is is a complete maestro some of the best musicians in the world all coming together to play in one band. And they are able to tap into the flow together, right? It's somewhat easy for a person to tap into the flow individually because you're not dealing with the moving parts of other people. But for so many people to tap into the flow together, that's something really special. Dream Theater is an incredible band. And so I was listening to some of their music and they had some music that was pretty dark and ominous. And I thought, even this dark, ominous, scary music is also coming from the Shakti, coming from the goddess. Because she is the, the source of all variety. There's nothing that she brings forth that is not a part of her, right? And so on the spiritual path, sometimes we want to associate spirituality with only peace, bliss, joy, happiness, contentment, right? Ecstasy. And if we're experiencing sadness, depression, abandonment, jealousy, rage, resentment. We want to think that's not, that's something different. That's something bad. I got to get rid of that. That's low vibrational. No, not at all. Even those emotions, just like a sad song, it's coming from the same source. It's coming from Shakti. So we honor it all equally, all equally. And if we can do that, then we can actually work with the difficult emotions 
work with the difficult things that are coming up without resistance. We can actually begin to relate with it and see it as a form of, of the Shakti's dance, right? So we can appreciate the masterpieces in all types of expressions, you know, horror films even like you can look at that and say wow this is also shakti this is also the goddess's expression even you know some some gory scary horror film with demons and whatnot also part of the goddess right and we see this in the forms of the goddess herself right shakti comes in so many forms um in india we don't really see shakti as a feminine you know personified goddess too often but we see lakshmi goddess of abundance goddess of prosperity we see kali right fierce you know you could say she's pretty negative and dark and ominous she's shakti is the the expression of variety and so she can come through us in so many infinite ways right so you can notice her everywhere and everything this way very easily everything that you observe is a doorway into her right then once you're in there you can begin to channel her forth so um I'll wrap up here by letting you know that because I'm so fired up about this, I've actually committed to begin writing a book. And these themes are are, are really supporting me to putting it all together. Um, I'm going to publish section of, sections of it. As I uh, begin to uh, put them together, I'm going to publish them on Substack in a sort of um, serialized way. And eventually it will turn into a book. Uh, more to come about this. I'm still working out the details with the goddess, but I'm just telling you all now I'm putting it out there. So there's a little bit of pressure on me, but also so that the muse, because I know she's listening, I want her to know that I'm serious. You know, I'm going to show up and do this work for her as a slave to her, like I said, but also for you, but also for myself too, because like I said, this is, you know, what I'm here to do. This is so, so exciting to sit here and channel and express. So of course I have to always on the, uh, as of late, at least, somehow figure out a way to segue into talking about my latest project, kundaliniawareness.org, right? So how this came to me, I talked about it last week. I was awoken in the middle of the night. I received a, a Shaktipat transmission from the late spiritual teacher, Ram Das. He threw in a, a lightning bolt at the back of my neck. I had a whole uh, energetic transmission. And then I was told to create kundaliniawareness.org. So the muse inspired me to create kundaliniawareness.org. Of course, we're putting this together uh, for the community to raise awareness about all of this that we're going through Kundalini Awakening. There are two major components to kundaliniawareness.org. There's a series of stories submitted by people just like you about your awakening process. Uh, we're trying to put together a large library of stories so people can enjoy the stories. We can relate. We can see that we're not alone. Researchers can look at them. Therapists can look at them and gather information that they need to move the culture forward. As well, we're putting together a directory of licensed mental health professionals with Kundalini Awakening experience that are available to support others, okay? So if you happen to be a licensed mental health professional, please submit an application to the directory. If you know somebody, please pass kundaliniawareness.org along to them. Please submit your stories. In fact, this could be a great avenue for you to experiment with what I'm talking about here. Show up at the blank document and just start typing and just see what comes out. The muse will inspire you, you know, give it a proofread over, look at the criteria and then submit it to kundaliniawareness.org and that can be your contribution. I really, really appreciate that. So now I want to open the floor up to others to share about anything that I've mentioned here today about creativity, but anything at all related to Kundalini Awakening. Um, if you have questions, that's great. I'll do my best to respond, but it's an, this is an interactive event. So I want to invite others to share their own thoughts as well. Scott also just finished the creative back by Rick Rubin. Really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Yeah. Colin, yes. The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron is a step-by-step -step guide to creativity. Yes. Colin had mentioned The Artist's Way to me. Um, I apologize. I haven't gotten to that one yet. Uh, I did look it up a little bit. And um, once again, it's another great book that Colin's recommending here, The Artist's Way. I found a copy at uh, the thrift store. So it is uh, in my possession. Um, and it will be, will be read as I embark on this uh, journey of writing a book. Noemi says, feeling tons of energy from this Zoom. Great. Yes, me too. Yes. Sarika says, thanks for the reminder. Very powerful. Oh, you're so welcome. Valerie, as a creatively repressed person, this convo is for sure for me. Yes, it's it's, it's for me too. I mean, I, I think we all are creative. It's just 
you know, we're, we're boxed in, right? We're told it has to be this way or that way. And, um, you know, we get stifled. KK is recommending The Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. It is gold. Okay, I'll add that one to the list as well. The Big Magic. Very exciting title. Jack says, how to find a creative avenue when one hasn't developed one yet? Yeah, I think try as many things as you can. Try as many things as you can. And uh, note when resistance arises. You know, if you've never really done photography intentionally, you may say, ah, what's the point? I, I, I don't want to be a photographer, this and that. Just give it a try for a day, a weekend. Give it a try. That's what happened to me. I just tried it. I became a photographer. Never would have thought in a million years I would have become a photographer. Uh, but before that, I tried painting. I tried, uh, I, I mean, I did a lot of writing, music, but photography really, really spoke to me. If you, haven't, if you haven't found an avenue, try as many things as you can. As many things as you can. Shiv says, a few weeks ago, I had a very profound meditation directly after the Zoom meeting. I got a download and I never get downloads. Yes. So downloads, I would say, maybe others would disagree, but to me, downloads are the same as the creative inspiration coming forth insights, messages. It's coming forth from that source, from that, the first force of all creation, Shakti. It's coming from there, right? I'm happy there's some people looking forward to my book. <laughs> well, we'll see um, how the process goes. I know it's going to take a life of its own. Right now, I have an outline. Um, I'm thinking the general direction I'm going in is a practical way to navigate this process without having to get caught up in all of the ins and outs, the nitty gritty, the 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 semantics of what is a nadi, what happens when Kundalini reaches the third eye. Let's drop all of the technicalities and return to a state of innocence and childlike wonder about this process in the same way that we went through puberty. We didn't think, oh, what's going to happen when my, uh, you know, my testosterone levels reach a certain threshold? What's going to happen? How can I, you know, make it to that point? We never asked any of those questions. We just went through it like children and it was successful. Same way we can go through Kundalini. We don't need to know every last detail about the process. So that's the direction that my book is going to be coming from. People have exhausted the, the details of, of Kundalini um, already. There's some great books that go really in detail about all the different chakras and petals and stuff. And as you know, I don't know much about all that stuff. But what I do know about through my own practice is how to just show up and surrender and to let her flow through how to show up in the container and to let her flow through. And so that's basically, you know, how I've navigated this Kundalini awakening process, how I've come to the point of talking about it, how I will also bring the book into existence. And that's also what the book will be about. It's just surrendering and showing up. That's it. So showing up and surrendering. So we'll see. So we'll see how it goes. Yes, Colin says here, you have great luck at thrift stores. Yeah, I've got really good luck. I have some some pretty far out books that like you can only buy in like India in like 1970. Like they're not available on the internet or anything. And I just find them. Um, yeah. KK says, started writing poetry after my crown chakra awakening. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Transcendental poetry, mystical poetry coming through. Shiv says, I feel the energy today from this Zoom in my brain. Anyone relate? Interesting. wonder if others can relate. Hey, everybody. Sorry, I went turn. I'm not camera shy, but I'm in the dark. So no problem. A bad lighting here. Um, yeah, um, the creativity thing. That, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I actually moved out here to Tucson a couple of years ago. Um, to, you know, my dream was to like write a book. I had a kind of idea what I wanted to do isn't specifically about Kundalini, um, more about self-realization, I guess. And just my story. Um, and I mean, I came out here, I was still working up until last, uh, July and I have a creative job. I, I make cartoons. I build cartoon shows. You know what I mean? I, I work on, uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons and I literally build the show before it's animated. And I mean, it's a really creative process. You know, sorry, the coyotes are going wild in the background. Can you hear that? Uh, no, no, but- um... Okay, okay, I'll, I'll go on with my story then. Um, but it's very creative, but very fast paced. Um, 
and it leaves me exhausted. And I tried to start writing and I tried to start writing and I was all like, oh, what about structure? How am I going to do this? How am I going to lay this out? How am I going to do this? You know, just going over and over in my head and then like sitting down and finally getting this creative burst and started writing. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then it's just like a big wall shut down. You know, I'm like, this ain't happening. And uh, so fast forward to January, I had been out of work for about six months. Um, I talked to you, Brent. I was a mess over Christmas, like a mess. I don't know what was going on with me, but I was like, okay, I got to do something. You know, I got to do something. I got to find a job. I got to do this. I got to, I don't know what I was going to do, but I was a mess, but I hadn't been working in months and I had been alone for six months. So I was just pretty much, you know, prime. And uh, at the end of January, I kind of looked to see what I wrote a year prior. And I kind of basically wrote like a first chapter and it was pretty, it was pretty good. It was like, I think someone would read this, you know, I, I was drawn into it. You know, I was kind of impressed with my creativity. And then I just started writing. I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I got to st stop thinking about structure. I got to stop thinking about where it's going. I just got to sit down and write. Fast forward two months later, um, I got about 150 pages written in two months. I sit down every day. Um, you know, I kind of give myself a rough time around 11, around 12, after I do my self-care rituals, walk the dog and stuff like that. And, eat. Um, and I mean, it just flows. I think I'm like 18 chapters in. And... You know, I, I know what I'm going into. I know my my trajectory, but it shows me where to go yeah. as I write. It shows me where to go. All the stuff I was thinking about before, all the structure and all this, it's working itself out. All I have to do is type. And, you know, it's my story, you know, and I know I'm in the flow and stuff, but man, it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And nothing in my life, I can say, and I've had creative jobs all my life. I've been semi-creative person into photography, into music, all kinds of stuff. But nothing has felt so real ever in my life. Like nothing has ever felt so genuine, so authentic. And, and besides the fact that it's just flowing is and how far I've gotten already. I mean, I'm almost done with my first draft. And I'll probably be done within another month to my first draft, if not sooner. And I don't know. I, I lost my train of thought there, speaking of creativity. Um, but but I don't know. It, it, it's like I, I consider this my job now. I'm like, I don't, I'm not looking for a job because this is my job right now. Um, I was worried about money. But... Some stuff happened, like I, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to pay all these taxes this year, blah, blah, blah. I ended up getting refund. So it's like I'm being, all this time is being purchased. And it's like the universe is going, no, you have to finish this. So I'm going to make sure that you have your mortgage paid and your bills paid so you can just concentrate on this. And that's what I'm doing. And it's 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 fantastic. And it's good. And And it's for me. You know, I'm writing it for me. I'm not writing it for you, anybody else. It's my story. And and just that is so empowering. And, you know, I know it's I know it's good. I know it's interesting. I have a story to tell. But but the best thing about it and and how cathartic it is too, how much healing is involved. Because, you know, basically, for those who don't know me, and I'm sure I you know me a little bit, Brent, but you talk about the dark night of the soul. I've been living with the dark night of the soul, you know, for 40 years. You know, that's been my life. So when I hear about people talking about going through it, I'm like, I've been there. This has been my life. And it's about me coming out of that and, you know, transforming and my story, you know, but it's happening as I write the book. 
it's like I feel myself transforming as I write the book. And it, it's crazy because like, I'll go to the group even now and I'll go to the, the message board or whatever, or one of these meetings. And what we're talking about in the meeting is aligning with what I'm writing about in that book at that time. So not only am I writing about something that I can relate to, getting, getting feedback from the group inspires me even more and I write even more creatively about the thing I'm hitting at that moment. It's the synchronicity is amazing, you know? And I give myself a break too. Like if I'm agitated that day or run down or it's a full moon, I'm like, dude, you can get to it tomorrow. You know what I mean? And and I do. But I mean, it's it's nonstop and it's been like this for since the end of January. You know, and it totally pulled me out of that depression. It pulled me out of the hole, whatever weird hole I was in. And now I just, I'm buzzing like, I've been buzzing for like a month and a half. I'm so in the moment, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I'm just like full steam ahead, you know? So that's my story. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just... There it is folks. Colin, thank you. Yeah. I look forward to reading this work. If you ever publish it. Um, I was just listening to a, a podcast with, um, forgot his name uh he, he does the daily stoic on youtube and uh he was speaking to rick rubin and rick rubin wrote uh, the creative act with neil strauss who's all also an author and neil strauss said the first draft is solely for you and that's like what you're sharing there colin it's for you you're writing for you and he says in the first uh -huh. draft don't hold anything back say everything you want bad mouth people say anything and everything that's for you. That's your healing work. Eventually, yeah, you can modify it a bit when, to make it for other people, but the first draft is for you. But I think you're tapping into this, this universal wisdom that you know many of the writers have understood. I mean, also you said, this is my job now, and it's the same concept here as uh, you know, Pressfield's turning pro. It's your job. You turn pro. You show up, and the muse shows up to inspire. This and, is and you know you know, it's crazy too. It's like, it allows me to own my own narrative. No one can second guess me. No one can tell me I'm wrong or that wasn't the way it was because it's there. It's there now. It exists now in my world and no one can, you know, and that's been my life. People second guessing you and telling you this and telling you that about yourself, gaslighting you and all this other crap. I'm like, they can't do this in this medium. It's like, I feel so protected within those words that I write, if that makes any sense. Oh yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. It's Brilliant. just owning your own story. It's owning, you know, it's, it's rewriting my life in a weird way. Yeah. Well, thank you for this direct lived experience that you're sharing with us. Even when you're sharing how, you know, you go over to the, uh, the conversations that are happening uh, online and they're speaking to directly, you know, what's going on in your, in your writing process. This is what uh, Pressfield and Ruben say in their own ways is that, you know, um, Ruben says, if you're looking for inspiration, you know, go to a coffee shop, just eavesdrop on a conversation. You know, maybe somebody will, will have a, have a, have the next step for you in your, in your book in in your art, whatever it is, inspiration comes from all over, but it's almost like it's not that you're trying to use what you find and make it fit your book. What you find is being gifted to you by the muse. Like it's, it's almost like everybody's in on it. It's a conspiracy in your favor. Like the people that are having the conversations in the coffee shop, they're inspired by the muse to speak about whatever they're speaking about with the right timing. So that when you show up, you hear what you need to hear so that you can then continue your book. It's like this huge interwoven synchronistic creative expression happening here and it's pure magic it's pure magic and pressfield talks about the same thing he says the muse will you know do all sorts of things like this um to support the work it's it's really far out stuff and i think this you know i want to hear your thoughts about this colin and anyone else 
I think this, where you're at right now is what the real aim of the process is not necessarily to be an author, but to, like you said, like you said, I'm buzzing. I've, I'm out of the, you know, feeling depressed. You're out of the dark night. You're creative. I think that's where the process is leading us all in our own way. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 it's really hard for me to argue with that. You know what I mean? Like I said, the, the key thing is I've never felt so authentic in my life. I've never felt something. I've ne This whole process, I've never once second-guessed myself. And man, I used to be a really insecure person. Everything was second-guessing myself. Everything. And for some reason, this process, it feels just 100%. I can't second guess myself on this because it, it just, I'd have to be in a state of psychosis to second guess myself. That's how, that's how locked in I am. It's, it's a fantastic feeling. I've never felt it in my life. And you know, I'm, I'm almost 54. I'm still 53. I'll nurse that for another month. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I thought, I thought my life was over, you know? And it feels like it's just starting. Wow. Oh, I'm I'm beaming because of the energy that you're radiating and also for you. And because of what you're sharing here, it's just so, so inspiring. Really, truly, it's so inspiring. Incredible. Um, you mentioned, you know, you came out of depression, you know, after you began writing. Even Pressfield, he writes that, you know, if you don't, if resistance beats you, eventually you become depressed because you are a creative being. And if you don't express it, you will become depressed. You'll become anxious. You'll become all sorts of bad things. And he said, you know, he, at one point he was really depressed. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but he was in a really dark place. He sat down to write. He wrote a page of garbage. And then he went to wash the dishes. And as he's washing the dishes, he, he caught himself whistling because he was feeling happy. He said, whoa, why am I whistling? And he recognized it's because I sat down and I didn't let resistance beat me. Even though I wrote garbage, I entered the flow. The muse came to me. I did my work for that day and I overcame, you know, feeling, feeling down. He started whistling after a very long time. And so this is, you know, perhaps for many of us, this may be one of the answers to address some of the difficulties, the emotional difficulties that we may have. I'm not saying it's, you know, the, the cure for, for, you know, some serious, you know, resistant treatment, resistant depression and whatnot, but it's an avenue to explore. If you're creative and there's no outlet for it, perhaps it's causing you to feel unwell to some capacity or another. Colin, thank you. Thank you so much. This is really fantastic. I always appreciate everything you share. And and of course, I hope you know that you know, at some point when and if your book comes out, which I hope it does, um, you know, please uh, let me know and I will I will spread it, spread it far and wide as best as I can. To, and I think some others here would be curious about it too. So thank you, Colin. Jasmine says, Kundalini energy breaks through the resistance and frees you from restraints that hinder the free flow of creativity. Brilliant. Well said. DLR says, I can't gather the energy to overcome resistance. Help. Well, I think uh, the the, uh, the the war of art will help overall, but you know, just show up, open open the canvas, open the documents, you know, press record on your camera, um, whatever it is, let garbage come out. Let's see what happens. Doesn't take too much energy to do that, I think. Um, but uh, it is a tricky battle with resistance, but the war of art gives you some really direct direct tips to navigate it. Premium Vises, how do you ground the creative energy if you are overcome with too much required research? Well, the creative energy inspires you to do all the work necessary for it. So it will inspire you to say, you know, set up a new space or move your furniture or to do research. You feel excited about it. So perhaps if you feel like I don't have the drive to do the research, perhaps there are some... Um, some some elements of your endeavor that aren't fully in alignment. This is what I found. Like when I get the creative flow coming through, like, you know, like I could almost do anything to to make it happen. Um, so I hope you can figure it out. Premium Vibes here shares, Shakti often gives me intense downloads of information. 
that I then have to do intense mathematical or hard science research in order to understand it. Is this a normal progression or is this, or is the intense amount of information required for my mental digestion and imbalance? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I would say that, yes, there are some of us that are called to, to do some, some, you know, intellectual work, um, mathematical stuff. I think that's all coming from Shakti. It's all coming from her. I think the Greeks, the muses, there's a few of them, actually, there's one for art, science, literature, maybe. So the muse comes in many different ways. So this can be her, uh, you know, moving through you. It doesn't have to just be in, you know, painting, for example. Yeah. Sinead says, very inspiring discussion. DLR on YouTube shares here. I think this was directed to Colin. Awesome story. Good to hear. Fantastic. Lady Yanni says, hi, everyone here from Tampa, Florida. Thank you in advance. I'm trying my best to hold the positive energy as best as much as possible. And it has definitely made me feel super creative in a few ways. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. So um, I guess, uh, did Sarika put her hand down? Sarika, did you have anything to share still? Sorry to keep you waiting. I just wanted to uh, connect with our, our friends on YouTube. Maybe someone else has anything to share on. Uh... Okay, let's just go over to Turth here. And Sarika, if you'd like to share, please, uh, you can raise your hand later. If not, no problem. Yeah, I just had a quick question for Colin and for you, Brent, as well. Um, I was just wondering, so how do you decide to start uh, a book or even like talking about a subject without really having, uh, you know, all of the information or, or the full information or even the complete information? Um, that's just, that's been something that I've been struggling with, like, you know, I, I feel like um, I heard Colin talking about uh, the dark night of, of the soul that he um, that he he was in the dark night of the soul for like 20 years. Um, so I was just wondering, like, um, how does he know that his journey has been uh, always complete or he, he has all of the information or the full knowledge before, you know, he can start talking about it or giving some information? Oh, yeah, I, 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 get, I get your question there. Um, I don't have all the answers, all the knowledge. Um, in fact, what I've understood is that at a certain point for some people, some individuals, the next frontier of their spiritual development comes only through teaching, sharing, writing about it. Um, because when we enter into the mode of author, writer, speaker, teacher, I'm not teaching knowledge. I'm not writing knowledge. I'm just showing up and allowing something to come through me from elsewhere, which I become a student of myself. So in a sense, the book that I'm writing, I don't know what it's about yet. I won't know until it's done. Then I'll sit down and read it and say, oh, that's pretty interesting because it didn't come from my mind. I'm just bringing it forth so that I can consume it myself, if that makes sense. So in some respects, it's an entirely selfish endeavor. I'm writing the book that I need to read to answer my own questions. I'm teaching and I'm speaking to others what I need to hear to answer my own questions. And often I, they're questions that I don't even know I have. And I need somebody like yourself to ask such a great question which part of me says, oh, that's that's a great question. I, what's the answer? And I ask myself, what's the answer? Like, for example, just now you asked the question. In my mind, I'm like, okay, what's the answer? I just be, get quiet. And when I'm quiet, then these words start flowing and this is what the answer is. Oh, interesting. That's new to me. It's fresh. And that's how it is. So the same can be for you. You don't have to say, okay, I'm ready now. I have all of the knowledge. Now I'm going to begin expressing. Mm -mm. you're ready when you're empty then you begin expressing and what comes forth it's you know fills you up and then you share it and now you're empty again and then you're like a you're receptive for more you get filled up you dump it you share it you express it and then you're empty and more comes through so this is what i found this is how the muse operates so we have to also recognize that it's on a subtle way it's a form of resistance to say i don't have the answers yet to write a book I don't have the answers yet to put out a talk 
uh, or a podcast or to talk to my friends in, about Kundalini or, or whatever it is. It's not like that. You can't, nobody has the answers for this. It's beyond the mind entirely. The only thing I know is how to show up and become empty and receptive and surrender and allow. That's the only thing I know. And I would argue that I don't even know that per se. That's my default state. When I was a baby, that's what I was. I was just totally surrendered, receptive, open like a sponge. I've just returned back to that default state. So in the same way in your own creative expressions, don't uh, um, hold yourself back by thinking that you have to have all the answers, have to have it all right, You know that you have to have the, the read all the books and have all the education, have all the practice before you put something out. It doesn't work like that. I think I've, I've forgotten the quote already, but the quote that I read in, in the, the Creative Act, I think he says, you know, something along the lines of the, the, the entirety of the work won't reveal itself to you until you start and keep going. So don't think that you need the entirety of the answers before you begin. You cannot. You must begin with just a little bit of a direction and then the entirety will begin to show up for you. And, you know, we can, we can argue that there isn't even such a thing as the entirety. It just keeps going and going and going. And um, that's the beauty of it. So I, I see, you know, you directed your question towards myself and Colin and Colin's got his hand raised here. So I'll, I'll see what Colin has to share about that. Well, yeah, I think you're hundred percent, man. Um, but you know, I did this simple little, little thing as, as my guide. Because I'm like, I need something. I, what I did was I had a beginning and I had an ending. And I literally went on the internet and said, how long is the average book <laughs> to be engaging? And, and I came up with myself, I'm like, okay, 200 pages. So I have a beginning and the end and 200 pages to fill. And okay, go. You know, and, and that's what I did. I just, and each new chapter I hit, I kind of pick a theme of that chapter in my story and it's pretty linear. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to start this? And I just start, I just start typing and I go, okay, each chapter is, I'm going to average about eight pages. So, okay, I got to type eight pages, but that's my formula. And it's, it's worked like a charm. You know, and how many, like how many words for each page? And I just cross check like average books out there. So I know I'm not skimping or, and that's my outline. And then I'm just writing all I know. And that's me. You know what I mean? I'm writing, writing what you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, I, I'm, I don't know who's talking. I'm sure everyone has a story to tell, everyone. And, and you know your story better than anybody. No, it's just pure authenticity, unapologetic. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So like, like I was sharing, you know, you recognized the masculine structure in your work. You need to fill 200 pages, eight pages per chapter. That's the masculine structure. Then you open yourself up. It's like a container. The feminine comes in and fills those pages up. Just like here, I said at 10 p.m. Eastern, that's the container I show up and the feminine fills it up. We'll see where it goes from there. Empowering stuff, Colin, thank you. Um, Sarika, how does that sound? Thank you so much. Um, uh, I mean, it sounds great. It sounds absolutely great. I'm still a little confused though, uh, just because um, I feel like it, it's really hard, especially when I myself don't have all the answers and I'm searching for those answers. So I feel like um, it's hard to talk about something that I don't have the full scope of it or, or I don't understand the full, um, where I still have so many questions. Even if I, I may know or understand a lot, but I don't know all of it. And I feel like I just can't talk about it until I, I have the, the answers to those questions. And I was also just wondering, like, what is the first step? Like, how do you even start? Like, Yeah, I mean, if, if you're thinking about, like, say, writing, for example, you, you quite literally open the, the document to a blank page. That's literally the first step. And just write one word. Um, 
and that's you've you beat resistance by doing so and then the muse comes in and begins to give you some more to write this is this is just the tried and true method um not that necessarily the first time you sit down you're going to write you know like a, a best selling novel but you get in touch with the flow and you see that you find that it feels good to even write garbage for example then you say you know what tomorrow i'm going to do the same thing and after a few days of doing it, suddenly like you're really in the flow and you're writing things and answers are coming from places that, um, you know, you don't even know about um, on the in level of the intellectual mind. I may be wrong. I may be wrong about this. I read this a while ago. There's a sort of spiritual author, Uspensky. I believe he wrote a book. Some time after he wrote this book, published the book, he finds... Gurdjieff's work reads Gurdjieff and says, Oh, after reading Gurdjieff, now I understood what my own book is about. Right. Um, so I may be a little inaccurate about the names in that story. Forgive me if I am. But the point is that there was a gentleman who wrote a book because he was in the flow. He didn't even know what he was writing and he had to learn through someone else's book about what his own book was about. That shows that you don't, the answers come from somewhere beyond your mind. You just have to show up. Uspensky sat down and began writing and the muse said, oh, here's somebody who's doing the work. All right, the muse will begin to express itself through you. This is just how it is. You show up regularly. But if we think that I'm not ready yet, then we're not ready yet. But if you say, I am ready, let's sit down and see what happens. Then you are. And the muse says, the muse comes to those who know that they're ready. We demonstrate that they're ready. You demonstrate by showing up. The war of art will really speak to you really speak to you and and know also that you know you don't have to tell people you're writing a book or, or putting out a podcast or anything you don't have to tell anybody just start see what happens because then you're not you have no pressure There's nobody to hold you accountable for whether it's succeeds or not you just start and do it for yourself like colin was saying this book is it's for him right it's for him so you write for you and then what can go wrong literally nothing can go wrong so that's where, you know, having some courage comes in, but give it a try. I'm telling you, once it starts to flow, it will really flow and it will, it's exhilarating. It's exhilarating. Just like Colin was sharing. He's buzzing. So thank you, Sarik. I'm going to go over here to uh, Turth. Um, hi, everyone. Hi there. Uh, I would like to, uh, so I had, a, I have a few questions about my uh, spiritual journey. So I had a spontaneous Kundalini awakening through a heroic dose of magic mushrooms. When I had some mushrooms, I uh, merged with the global, the divine consciousness and the idea of self dissolved and I was just left with a pair of eyes. And then this uh, power in me then awoken and I, I felt the shivers running through my, I, I felt electricity running through my spine and everything. And that's the awakening story. After that, uh, I have been in contact with an entity or I don't know what to call it, but uh, it's like it buzzes in my ear. So... I think it's my guardian angel. That's what people say. It's a guardian angel, but uh, it's like buzzing in my left ear. So when uh, so I have this very weird relationship with numbers and synchronicity. It's it's as if like uh, the universe is talking to me constantly. If I if I'm listening to a song and if I'm thinking about a song, a car would pull up next to me with the same song, same line. Uh, this would happen like ten times, fifteen times, and uh, I would have this uh, repeated numbers pop in front of me like three 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 one one one. Uh, four, 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 seven, 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 multiple times. Like, I went to a restaurant and uh, the bill came out to be seventy-seven dollars. So I told my sister, "See, this is this is an angel number." So she was like, "No, it's not. It's just coincidence." So then she told me that uh, when we go home, we have a deck of cards. If you pull out the seven number card, then I will believe you. And in front of her, I shuffled the card and I pulled the card out. It was a seven card, <laughs> and she just she just froze. So. And this uh, entity or angels, like it's it's a very loving. It's not it's not not at all negative. It's like a loving presence. So it's it's like protecting me. It's like uh, it's like providing love to me and it's supporting me. And uh, I can hear it through a buzzing in my ear, in my left ear, but I can't communicate verbally. It's like a more of an intuition communication. So if I have a question, I can ask the question, and maybe I'll get a dream about it, or maybe. Uh, the buzzing will, if, if, so I've uh, developed this form of communication. When I ask a question, the entity will like, uh, if the answer is yes, the voice will go very loud. And if the answer is no, the voice will go very low. So if I ask, so should I continue on my Kundalini awakening? 
the voice will go and if i ask like some dumb question it will go down so uh, i had a question about this so what is this and like how do i uh, like improve my communication with this entity or guardian angel and uh, so i think this started uh, so during shivratri i i i sent you a message that uh, i want to do a meditation session on shivratri so during shivratri i i was going through some financial problems and uh, i wanted to go to the mandir to like ask the deity for some guidance and when i went there there was like 3 4000 people and there was no way of going in the temple it was like fully blocked there was police everywhere and it was so we we like gave up like we were, we thought we wouldn't be able to go inside but we were on when we were, we were on the ground uh A, a door behind the temple opened and a random guy just came to me and he said you want to go inside the temple i was like yeah sure why not and he just let me in and i went in it was like it was unreal when i went in there were like bouncers there was volunteers everywhere the 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 entry was closed and i had a special access i went through the temple and i i sat sat in the center of the temple beside me was the mayor of ontario and there was like vip people i don't know how i got there so it was like very uh, crazy experience and ever since then this it it's like a divine presence around me like i can constantly feel it but i can't communicate to it like directly so is there a way to like ascend and like raise my vibration to communicate verbally through through this entity or is just through numbers oh fantastic sharing turth uh you're, you're definitely in the flow definitely in the flow some auspicious experiences happening to you which are simultaneously mind blowing and incredible and yet at the same time of course of course you would get vip access to the temple of course right <laughs> so fantastic thank you for sharing yeah um not uncommon for people to hear the ringing in the ears and that's an indication of you know the divine communicating with you in this auditory way trust it wholeheartedly really trust it it is yeah, a known do, experience yeah it's a known experience it's common the more that you trust it the more that you're be, you'll be able to uh rely on that information oh it, it just started just when you just said it trust it it just started like it's buzzing right now it's yeah, crazy yeah yeah so so the more that you trust it the more that you can develop a uh more intimate direct specific dialogue with it um it's the intelligence of your body it's intelligence of your higher self your kundalini shakti god mm. your angels whatever you like to call it it's all the same it's all one right so for you it's communicating in this way um know as well that if it at some point ceases doesn't happen as frequent it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong it's not going to be there as this thing that you can turn to rely on for every little decision every second of your life you still have to live your own life this is there to supplement you to give you some guidance now and then but don't feel as if you need to absolutely cultivate this relationship to the point where like you know the shiva himself is in front of you in the flesh speaking to you directly like it's not that necessary to get to a point like that per se you already have a very close relationship with it trust it and just move ahead on your journey and know that um you know you said this began for you at uh mahashiva ratri which is yes. only quite recent right so i so i i uh, like i was going through some problems so there was like very financial problems and i went to the temple and then i prayed to the deity when i came back home uh, i stayed up whole night i didn't drink any water i had a fast and i was meditating the whole night i meditated for like from like 12 to till 6 in the morning i was meditating and nothing happened but then from the next day like i, I synchronized with the universe like everything just everything was like i feel it as if the reality around me is like constantly changing and communicating to me it's like as if yeah. the universe is constantly talking to me oh 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 it is it is yeah so so what i mean to say is you've made a big shift already in in only recent time it's been you know two or three weeks i think yeah um the shift that you've made is fantastic i mean that's in some respects that's a significant shift for an entire lifetime so don't feel the need to now rush ahead to the next thing the next thing the next thing take it slow allow the system to become integrated 
with this energy, allow the energy to become integrated into your system, into your nervous system. It will keep you grounded, steady. And remember, you have a lifetime of spiritual development to go through. So we don't want to, you know, get bored of one experience and hope for the next. Enjoy what you've got going on right now. Let the flow take you. Surrender to God's time and God's plan and know that you're doing everything that you should be doing properly. Just keep going in the right direction. And, and you know that you're doing everything right. Why? Because the angel numbers are showing up. The synchrony is showing up. You're having these auspicious invitations into the temple despite you know, the police and all these people, yeah. you know, blocking the entrance, whatever. You have a lot of momentum behind you. Just trust and surrender and, and enjoy the enjoy the ride. There's no rush for any of this, but um, really fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll go over here to Noemi. Hi, Noemi. Hey. Um, so I just pulled a card from an Oracle deck I have, and I just wanted to read it Please. just to see if, you know, anybody or myself resonate. <clears throat> so, and I'll, I'll show the card in a minute, but so it's called alignment. Okay. So inner integrity, being a vibrational match for what you want to bring into your life, manifesting from a place of love over fear. Energy flows where attention goes, subconscious sabotage, seamlessly actualizing your dreams. We all have the ability to manifest the life we wish to call in. However, we may find our desires are not actualizing as we hoped. Energy goes where attention flows. And if our thoughts and focus fixate on something that opposes what we want to bring into our lives, this will cause dissonance. If there's an if there's an internal sabotage, are we, without realizing, undermining ourselves through our language, our worries, and the broken records that plan our minds? To bring something to your life, become the vibrational match for it. Imagine what it feels like to already have what you desire and cultivate that feeling. This is the key to powerful manifesting, preparing ourselves in our environment as if what we are manifesting is a certainty also creates a shift in our thinking. When we want and strive for something, we create more wanting and striving. When we immerse ourselves in what is, what it's like to already have something, we will be in the perfect vibration to receive it. Consider whether you're choosing to manifest something from fear or love. Unfortunately, if our wants are driven by or born out of fear, we're, we're going to amplify this. When our heart motivates our desires, whatever we manifest is aligned with love. <clears throat> Look at where your desires and manifestations are being seated. If your plans or dreams aren't un unfolding as you would like them to, it's time to take a deeper look at other areas in your life. Is something out of is something out of step with integrity? Are you making decisions through fear or love? If it's through fear or avoidance, your manifestations may seemingly backfire to encourage experiences that will bring you back into balance. It is time to become a vibrational match for what you're seeking instead of striving harder for something. Cultivate the feeling of already having all that you seek. You'll be surprised at what this shift in perspective creates. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Is that speaking to you, uh, Noemi? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's it's kind of like maybe a couple weeks ago for me, kind of. I was feeling into that. Not so much like this week or last week. So maybe that message wasn't for me. Because, you know, I have been feeling, you know, I think everybody's energy as a whole tonight. Um, so yeah. I hope that did speak to at least one person here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure it I'm sure it did. It spoke to me. You know, the point of self-sabotage there, I think, uh, spoke to me about this this war of art between our higher selves and the force of resistance you know we can give in mm -hmm. to self-sabotage oh thank you so much for tuning in and bringing that forth and uh, if anyone can relate please uh, let us know in the chat on youtube on zoom perhaps some are listening back in the archive on the recording and that's speaking to them thank you noemi i appreciate it mm -hmm. okay, so deborah's got her hand up here Hi, interesting. Hi, interesting conversation tonight. Um, 
in many ways. And I, I love hearing other people's stories. Um, there, there's a lot, lot that um, I'm processing currently, um, not only on the creative side of, of how spirit expresses itself, but I'm getting older and I'm, I can feel my body changing and I can't do some things I used to do so easily, like play my guitar, which is very, very upsetting because something that feels so natural and then becomes a challenge. It's, it's, um, it's stressful. But um, so one of the things that I, um, I'm kind of learning to prepare for and accept is that when I do die and I do pass from this life to my next incarnation to make sure that in whatever way I, I can um, to fully embrace it and to feel as though that the reason I've, I've come into this life, um, that my work is finished or at least as much as I could expect. There's certainly a lot of things that I am in despair about, mostly about the, the state of the world. Um, but there's also been like just an incredible inspiration that has come from uh, connections with a uh, spirit. Um, I don't like using the word twin flame or soulmate anymore. It's, it seems to be so culturally bound, but there's a, a definite connection. And so like when it comes to creativity, the music that I've created over the last 10 years comes so freely and so fast. Like every day I'm writing poems, I'm writing music of, of all different kinds of genres. And um, I know that part of this is like making sure that my message to my beloved one and to the creator, um, that it's, it's like, I'm so grateful and I'm ready to to move on. And it's it's actually quite a blessing to be able to go through these steps. And sometimes it's really hard, you know, I've I've gone through a lot of things in my life that are difficult to share with people. They look at you like, what in the world are you talking about? And I've had a lot of that sort of thing, but I've learned for myself that um I've become so much more tuned to to other persons, other people's struggles, or even just questions. And so it's really wonderful to be able to tap into that wisdom over this lifetime and, and encourage others to continue on, you know, to keep the faith and do what you need to do to take care of yourself, but to always move forward. So anyways, so I'm, I don't... I just don't know why, but I have a feeling, I don't think this is, I think this is the last year of my life. And so um, I've been producing just so much music. It's like, I have to get this done. I have to get this done. I have to get this done. And it's just, it's such a, it's not where I expected to be at this age. I don't know exactly what I expected, but so anyways, um, yeah. So thank you for having this space. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat to one of my most recent um, works. It's classical music for the most part. I do other things, but this was inspired directly from this kind of an experience. But I love this conversation, Brent. It's really wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so much for holding this space for us. Oh yeah, thank you, Deborah, for, for contributing. And please share the link to your music. I will check it out and I'll invite others to, to check it out as well. Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I can relate to you with this idea of getting everything out in order to leave a legacy um, before our time here is up. And it's like a, you know, I, I can't speak to your specific experience about, you know, perhaps this is the last year for you in, in this incarnation. The idea of memento mori, you know, and, and living fullest in alignment with our purpose, our passion, which would be, you know, give our gifts. If this really was, you know, the last things that we do, we'd want to leave behind a legacy of our, our greatest gifts. And that's how I'm doing my best to live. I'm not perfect at it, but what's interesting is when I was invited to begin doing this work, I was given a timeline. So I have a, a 
a, a specific year in mind, which I was given, um, for this work. Now, whether that means I will die when it's that year comes, I don't know, but uh, I was told a, a specific timeline. So I have like a, a sort of countdown, and in some respects, I'm trying to get as much done as I can before that time happens. So I can relate with you there. It's like, I have to just give it out and leave behind this legacy. Um, but I consider that timeline that I was given this countdown, I consider it to be like a, a very incredible gift. It's a fire under my ass to get up and do something. Um, so I, I see it as a, as a good thing. I don't know if, if others have a similar experience, but, um, you know, sounds like uh, some incredible things are flowing through you and it's coming from a place of, of wanting to give. And I will definitely check out your music and, and use it as a tool. Like I was sharing earlier, you know, listening to the different forms of art and music and creativity and trying to tap into the source of where it came from. I'm going to do that with your music um, because of course I know you're going through this process with us in touch with the flow so i'll feel it in and i see here deborah sharing the link soul contract is the title of this composition i'm going to paste that link into the youtube chat if that's okay with you deborah for those listening on youtube yes please do yeah thank you okay i'll type that in on on youtube as well for those that want to check it out right and, and i appreciate your your response to it's very heartwarming. Oh, you're, you're and welcome. Loving. Did you have anything coming up that you want to share on that point? No, um, I'm going to hopefully start writing some things down, but um, I, I just love being in spaces where other people are vulnerable and um, sharing some of their deepest experiences. It Fantastic. means a lot to me. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Shiv sharing here. This discussion has got me thinking about chanting my hobby uh chanting i've led several chanting and meditation sessions in the past and a ton of energy would flow in incredible yeah chanting in, in essence is another way to invoke to invoke to summon the goddess we show up great zade sharing that he's terrible at writing but i'm gonna do my best and write my story for kundalini awareness Org. this convo is inspiring me Fantastic, fantastic. I'm sure you're you're not terrible at writing, but I appreciate anything that you may share. Sinead says, when drawing, sometimes you can see the lines on the blank page and you just have to follow them. Oh, I like that. I like that. It's kind of like some musicians, I think they, they report hearing melodies in their head, right? It's just like it, it comes from somewhere else and then they, you know, perform it through their instruments. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um... Um, it's regarding the uh, the people. I mean, uh, the ones that are on the on this journey are familiar with the term, but we I know we don't like to talk about it. The twin flame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but I just had a question in regards to that um, because I I believe you are also familiar with that. Uh, do you have Do you happen to know if um, if one of the twin um, has a, a kundalini awakening, does the other twin uh, go through similar experiences or uh, does does it trigger his awakening in any ways? Or I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah gr great question. I'm uh, quite comfortable speaking about the twin flame thing. Um, I've done a lot of uh, reflecting and contemplation on it. And, and uh, you know, I've been through a, what I would consider a twin flame journey myself. Um, I'll say that when I look at the twin flame landscape, the conversations that are being had, the experiences people report, many people like to look at it through a, a sort of black and white lens. This is my twin flame. Therefore, we will go through the same process together to the same degree, the same intensity at the same time. I think that that is too simplistic of a perspective the twin flame thing yeah there are some certain 
similarities. Both will perhaps be on a spiritual path. You cross paths. Some interesting challenges arise to trigger a lot of growth. However, um, they are an individual as are you are an individual, as I am, as the person who I would say was my twin flame, individuals. And of course, as we know, one of the most fundamental things that I, I speak about in my work with Kundalini is though there are universal themes that we see across the board with everybody that goes through Kundalini awakening, the process itself is highly individualized. And one of the factors that it comes down to it being individualized is, you know, the degree, the intensity, the pace of one's Kundalini awakening process. So one twin may have a very intense awakening, rapid, full-blown firework show, energy up the spine, the full thing. The other may just have a very subtle sort of uh, glimpse, brief energetic phenomena, maybe no energetic phenomena, and they don't acknowledge Kundalini. They have not, they don't really even know they're going through anything significant. And perhaps they're not really even going through a very um, developed Kundalini process at all. So even though, you know, you may be twin flames, it doesn't mean that both the people are going to go through like, you know, a sort of um, equivalent type of awakening process. It's going to be unique to everybody. Um, of course, you have to also consider that these are also the, the elements that draw people that are, you know, say twin flames together is differences, you know, opposites attract, complementary people are drawn to one another as well. So because they're different, this means that they're going to have different awakening processes at different timelines. And so um, many may think that, okay, I've had, a, I've had a Kundalini awakening, maybe my twin will, maybe they won't. I hope that they do, because if they do have a Kundalini awakening, then, you know, we can have something more in common. We can go through it together. We can heal together. Or maybe we are hoping that crossing our fingers saying, I hope they have a Kundalini awakening soon so they can heal and stop acting so difficult and just, you know, cooperate with me so we can be forever in love. So these are some of the ways that, you know, people will consider this twin flame thing. I think it's far more nuanced, far more um, um, intricate and complex. And we should do our best not to look at it through a black and white lens hoping that, you know, the twin flame is literally a one-to-one -one mirror for us. It's not really like that. I think that's too simplistic of a perspective. The twin flame is a mirror, but um, not a perfect mirror. And so this has been my experience. I, of course, you know, I've had a massive Kundalini awakening. Person that I identify as my twin flame, I haven't been in touch with them in, ooh, I don't know, five, six years. So maybe they're having a, a Kundalini awakening now. I don't know. But as far as I can tell, they didn't really have anything close to what I was experiencing. So I can say that. And I've seen similar things with, with other twin flame, um, quote unquote, uh, couples out there. Um, so that's what I can share about that. But um, yeah, the twin flame thing, uh, it, it's a tricky, tricky conversation to have. Uh, I put out a talk about it um, on my channel. Um, spoke about my experiences, if anybody's curious, but I triggered a lot of people with what I was sharing about it because it's, it's a touchy, uh, sensitive topic. So um, I hope I didn't uh, trigger anybody here today, but if I did, sorry. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for talking about it. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hmm. Lady Yanni here is asking on YouTube, do you believe that every twin flame has to meet up in every lifetime? I feel like I'm meant to not be in a relationship. I also feel it's a journey within, not a person. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like I said, even when I was speaking to Sarika, you know, this idea of twin flames is looked at in this black and white thing. Like they have to meet up in every lifetime. That's what happens when you're a twin flame. I don't think so. I think it's far more complex than that. Far more complex than that. Um, so I don't believe that they have to meet up in every lifetime. Um, in my prior lifetime, I was a celibate um, practitioner who was not in a relationship. 
in this lifetime, I encounter somebody who I would say is my twin flame. I was in a relationship with them briefly. So that, you know, at least based on what I know about my previous lifetime, you know, we don't have to meet up in every lifetime or relate in every lifetime or whatever it is. Um, if you feel like you're not meant to be in a relationship and you feel like it's a journey within, then by all means, lean into that. I think that's the best place to enter into a relationship from not desperately looking for it, doing our own inner work. Then when we encounter somebody that's hopefully doing the same type of work, we're like, Hey, I wasn't really looking. They're like, I wasn't really looking either. I don't really need to be in a relationship. And they're like, me too. Oh, great. We can be in a relationship together because we're not going to, you know, um, be super clingy or, you know, all that kind of thing. So maybe a, a paradigm to approach it from, but, um, Ultimately, the attitude you have there is, is great, you know. It's a journey within. It's a journey within. Interesting stuff, Lady Yanni, coming to us from YouTube. So Shiv says, I have a random question. What do you think of these starseed people? It seems so off to me. And Molly's adding here, yeah, I think there's some truth to it, but it's been hijacked and used as escapism. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, the starseed thing is not something I lean into. However, I have had a few encounters with my guides who are Pleiadians from another star system. And I guess that means I'm a starseed. I don't know. I don't really use that language. It doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve, um, the people that I work with, um, I can see like Molly was sharing here, how this thing gets hijacked and used as escapism. People say, oh, I'm from another planet. I'm not meant to be here. I feel like I'm in the wrong place. There was a mistake made. You know, I, I should have been born in some other galaxy and I'm here on earth. Nobody understands me. I can relate to those sentiments, but I don't complain about that kind of stuff. I recognize I didn't come here by mistake. I'm here to do some work as a human being, which involves leaning into being a human being rather than leaning into being from another galaxy or whatever. So that's what I can say. If it resonates with you, great. If it doesn't, just leave it behind. I don't really lean into seeing people with these types of labels as quote-unquote authorities per se. Not saying that they're not. I just don't know enough about that to vet them. But what I do know enough about is mysticism, the Kundalini awakening process, self realization, um, the depths of meditation. So when somebody says I'm going through that stuff or I've experienced those things, I can say, okay, I can, I can, I can understand where you're coming from. I can recognize you as a as an authority. That's my discernment. But when somebody says I'm a star seed, you should listen to me. I come from you know, serious or something. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that type of information. And I don't know if you're making it up or not, or, you know, so that's the way I use my discernment when it comes to like these people that are, you know, saying they're star seeds and stuff. Um, I don't really use that term, but like I said, yeah, I've had some encounters with the Pleiadians who have, you know, supported me in this work. Whether that makes me a star seed. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Noemi is relating here. I don't really like the I don't like the terminology anymore, but I do feel that a lot, if not all of us, are connected to non-human beings. Yes, I, I agree. Yes, Colin says, "Do you think it's a form of bypassing?" It could be. It totally could be, especially when people are saying I'm from another galaxy, another planet, and whatnot. Therefore, my human life is like a you know, so write off or or whatever. I think that's a form of bypassing. Hopefully, those who come to that can kind of eventually come to a point where they recognize that, you know, they're here as a human being for a reason and they begin to do whatever it is that they're meant to do rather than, you know, complain about the state of the world and the burden of being a human being and all that kind of stuff. Hugo says here, identifying as something is just another distraction. That's my take on star seeds. Yep. Yep. I, I like it. I like it. Dolores, Lady Yanni shares here, Dolores Cannon goes into great detail about Starseeds and much more. It may shift the mentality of anyone that has many questions about that. Yeah, so you can check out Dolores Cannon for those that are interested. I haven't really explored her work though. I know she's been around for a long time. Yeah. 
Colin says, don't get me wrong. I feel like an alien a lot. Me too. I totally do. I totally do. And Valerie says, I think it can be. I just hate the labels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much for another really, really exciting Kundalini After Dark session. Um, I appreciate you all for sharing, for for relating about uh, the, the creative experiences you've had. Hopefully you've been inspired by the uh, conversations that we've been having today. If, if you're feeling like, you know, you're on the brink of expressing something creative, please do it. Join the private Facebook community, which I will link in the chat on Zoom here. You can share, you can um, um, get some, some feedback, allow people to enjoy your work, whatever it is. Sharing a bunch of links here. The private Facebook group, I'm only sharing it for those that are on Zoom. So I'm keeping it somewhat small and intimate. Um, every day, there's some really deep conversations happening. There are a lot of people really supporting uh, openly. It's it's really incredible. Um, so it's a great uh, resource as well that you can join. If you ever have any questions, you know, you can pose a question there in the group. And a lot of really wise, open-hearted, experienced people are there to, to offer what they can. So Thank you to all who have uh, been contributing to the Facebook group. It's pretty incredible. Appreciate it. Of course, kundaliniawareness.org. Check it out. Submit your stories. Um, if you'd like to donate, the link is there in the description as well as in the chat. That would go a long way for me. I appreciate it. It allows me to keep doing this. Got my course available for those that are you know dealing with a lot of energy in the body. I'm on grounded spiritual emergence and integration. The course is there. If you'd like to meet with me one-to-one, -one, available for that as well. Tomorrow, Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, Kundalini Q&A meeting. It's completely free to join, just like this uh, today on Zoom. Uh, we won't stream it live to YouTube. I'll take some questions. And if there's time, I'll open the floor up and allow some others to share as well. Always a good time, the Kundalini Q&A meetings. Check out my channel on YouTube for uh, uh, clips from those meetings. I post a video every other day. Um, I've also got a new offering, which is a 24 seven ish, uh, chill radio station, streaming some episodes from my podcast, some interviews with people that have gone through Kundalini awakening, some of my talks, some of these, uh, recordings here from the after dark sessions streaming uh, 24 seven ish. So sometimes my internet goes down, so we'll have to start it up again, but, um, you know, we've got some chill music in the background. You can just put it on in the background and kind of do your thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much. Really, really appreciate you all. Appreciate you all. Okay. Kundalini After Dark, thank you all so much. Let's get some sleep. I'll see you next time. Much love, everybody.